So I'm Brad Topol. I'm IBM's Distinguished Engineer for Open Technologies and Developer Advocacy. And the main portion of this talk is going to be about Kubernetes fundamentals and advanced platform capabilities. So in a short amount of time, we're going to take you from the history and the basics all the way to some advanced features. Uh, but before I get into that, um, I'm going to uh, do some call for code announcements. And it, I don't know if everyone on the call here is familiar with call for code, but it's, it's, it's a way to have an impact on the world. And it's also a way to win a very large amount of money. So if you're not familiar, um, natural disasters affect 2.5 billion people every year with property loss and human loss. And we can't prevent natural disasters but we can find better ways to prepare for them and better ways to respond to them. And uh, the folks that are the most, uh, in many ways, the most capable to, to come up with great solutions are software developers. And so a few years back, uh, about three years ago, we decided to, to put together what we called Call for Code. We put it together with um, the David Clark cause of the United Nations Human Rights uh, uh, Commissioner Council and the Linux Foundation. And the idea was let's, let's get developers thinking about how they can uh, help mitigate natural disasters and let's have a coding competition. Let's have a coding challenge. And yes, uh, software developers want to do things to, to help the world, but let's also put some pretty solid prize money behind it. And so every year there's a call for code winner that wins a $200,000 prize. Um, we also have second place, third place, fourth place, um, and those are $25,000. And we have a regional award winner, which I'm gonna announce in a couple charts for our, 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 our North American regional winner. But the, the important thing is, is to understand that there is a wonderful way here for developers to form small teams and come up with fabulous solutions to, to very difficult problems uh, you know, related to natural disasters, related to pandemics. But what differentiates Call for Code is once we see some really great solutions come, come from the developers, we don't stop there. We actually fund deploying those solutions out in the field. So it's not just, a, oh, we came up with a great idea. We won some prize money. Isn't that great? We actually get behind the winners and actually help them to deploy their solutions where they can make a huge difference. So uh, we have this, uh, this challenge every year, and I would encourage you to form your small team and, and get involved. Um, so if we want to look at uh, past winners, just, just so you can see what we've done in the past, um, the first winner in uh, 2018 was Project OWL. And this came about a huge hurricane hit in Puerto Rico. And what people learned is your cell phones don't work. You know, all the cell towers go down. And Project Owl looked at how they could create an ad hoc Wi-Fi net mesh network that could allow people that had no other connectivity otherwise to be able to say, hey, I need food, I need water. And so they demonstrated it and built this on a whole bunch of uh, cloud technologies, uh, you know, IBM, we have lots of Watson cloud technologies and we have all the weather company APIs. So you can put together some really cool solutions that can help people in need. And so that was the 2018 winner. And in 2019, we had a different approach, which was dealing with fires and firefighters and making sure that the firefighters had something that would monitor their surroundings. So we could tell when firefighters were getting into really dangerous situations you know, um, with, with way too much carbon monoxide or what have you. And so that was the 2019 winner. And just recently announced, uh, not too many, a uh, few days ago was Agrali, which was um, from Brazil um, to, to help small scale farmers manage resources and understand the impact on climate and help them to, to worry from, you know, how the crops are doing and, and how to manage that. And if you look, all three of these winners are, there's deployments underway. So Project Owl was deployed in Puerto Rico and Australia. Prometeo was uh, deployed in Barcelona and Australia. 
and the new winner of Grali was uh, tested and used in Mongolia. So those were all big $200,000 winners. Um, I don't have the pleasure of announcing a $200,000 winner today. I do get the pleasure of announcing a $5,000 regional winner. And that winner is um, High Stakes. So High Stakes was a team in Puerto Rico and they actually worked uh, help deploying the original winner, Project Owl. So these were folks that were involved in getting to deploy a previous winner, and then they got inspired to come up with their own solution. And what they came up with was the notion of the stakes that you stick in the ground that monitor moisture levels and humidity levels. And basically this helps you to worry about anomalies like flooding and other weather anomalies, and then to send alerts. So to be able to get some proactive information out that, hey, certain areas are starting to flood and we need to take action. So this was our regional, our North American regional winner. And uh, we're happy to award them $5,000. And for everyone on this call, I would encourage you to, to look into forming a team because if you come up with a great idea and you go implement it, we'll actually, one, you'll, you'll, we'll give you a, a very nice prize and you'll get to deploy it. So you can make a huge difference in the world. So, so please, please think about doing that. Um, all right, Danielson from High Stakes is on the call. Congratulations. Congratulations, Danielson, that's awesome. And so I'm glad you, I didn't know you'd be on the call, but um, great that you're here and, and you know, and, and, and enjoy your win and enjoy the, the award, but more importantly, thank you for what you're doing to help make the world a better place. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears and you know, this is an interesting talk. It's one of my favorites to give because it helps people to understand from the very beginning uh, containers and Kubernetes, and then we'll go on and get into some advanced stuff until they give me the hook and pull me off this stage. So we'll see how much we can cover. But um, let's talk about containers. So if we go back to about 2012, most of us who are working in the cloud infrastructure space were using cloud infrastructures that were virtual machine based. And life was pretty good. You could get your virtual, your applications running as virtual machines. You could get things uh, like web applications and databases, uh, say deployed in a couple days, uh, way better than if you had to deploy things on bare metal servers all by yourself, trying to get an application server up and running, a database up and running. Life was pretty good. Um, virtual machines were a decent way to go. But then in 2013, um, at PyCon, there was a presentation by Solomon Hikes who said, hey, all you folks who are doing all this, deploying your applications and your cloud applications using virtual machines, well, turns out I can do something a little bit different. Linux has really improved its security. And so instead of deploying as a whole virtual machine, I can deploy applications as processes that take advantage of Linux advanced features to provide isolation. So I can give my processes their own file system. I can give them, um, I can isolate them from other processes and I can give them guaranteed limits on CPU and memory. And so now when I wanna start up an application, um, it's just starting up a process. And so it'll start up really, really fast. Plus I figured out how to give the process its own little file system I could make sure I package up all the libraries and code that the process needs to run in its own little package and I'm gonna call it a container. And so now I can package things up, I can isolate them from other things. And um, since it has its own little file system, I can do snapshotting. I can snapshot your, your container images, your process images and snapshot the differences. And I can do that way faster than snapshotting a virtual machine. So we, we saw a world where we, most of us used to use virtual machines to do everything, but now somebody was showing us a way to do it with these new things called containers, which were just processes that had some advanced isolation features. And they were showing us how to create things much faster because if you start a virtual machine, it takes a lot of time to start up. And if you snapshot it, it snapshots the whole virtual machine 
that takes a lot of space and a lot of time. And here they're doing these things with containers that started up real fast and snapshotting was really fast. And this was a huge step forward. And so you can see a picture of this that, you know, you've got these different processes with their source code and libraries, each one's a container and they're all running on a Linux kernel. Um, and this is much more efficient than running virtual machines because on a virtual machine, if I wanna put say three on a server, um, each one has the application and then a full virtualized Linux kernel that's part of the virtual machine. But with containers, I just have the applications and they're all sharing the same Linux kernel. So I'm able to pack a lot more containers onto a server than I could with a virtual machine. So these are way more efficient. So containers really started taking off and they started getting exciting. And then people needed to figure out how to provision these. How do we manage them? How do we manage them running on a cluster? Well, it turns out, um, you know, the original uh, creator of the container, Solomon Hikes, he started a company called Docker. Maybe you've heard of it. And so you know, the Docker became very, very popular. And now it was time to orchestrate the Docker containers. And, and there was a couple different approaches, but the one that really won out was called Kubernetes. It came originally from Google and um, Google, believe it or not, just like Docker had been running things in containers for a very, very long time. And so they, you know, if your, your Gmail account, for example, runs in a container, if you didn't know it. And so they have a lot of expertise with what we call orchestration, which will provision, manage and scale your container-based applications across a cluster. And so what happened is after some convincing, uh, Google was willing to donate Kubernetes to a foundation. And the one that was started was the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And why this was important and why it helped Kubernetes to succeed was when you put something in a foundation, you have open governance and you have a level playing field and now you have multiple vendors willing to contribute to the project. So it's no longer a single vendor open source. So you have multiple folks willing to contribute and this helped Kubernetes to grow and become the de facto standard for um, container orchestration. Um, we'll, we'll get into it in more detail, but the beauty of Kubernetes is it has a declarative model. So you get to declare what you want to happen. You tell Kubernetes what you want to happen. Hey, I would like six copies of my application up and running. And so Kubernetes takes your declarations and it makes it and, and turns it into something that's implemented. It actually does and creates your six copies of your applications and gets them up and running. So, so really exciting there um, what, what Kubernetes is able to do. So just a quick history of what happened, just to sum up, again, PyCon, March 2013, the world was introduced to containers. Uh, then Google released Kubernetes as its container management uh, solution for orchestration. Um, after some convincing, um, the, there was the creation of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Kubernetes became the seed technology and the CNF has grown huge. There's over 500 member companies. It now hosts over 33 open source projects that are somehow related to Kubernetes. And um, uh, the, you know, there's been even huge, huge numbers of distributions of Kubernetes that are now uh, certified by the CNCF. So a lot of great progress there. Um, checking out the Kubernetes architecture it basically allows you to run across a cluster. You have a master node that you can interact with via API user interface or via command line interface. And that's who you're telling to get your, your, your containers up and running. And then you have a whole bunch of worker nodes in the cluster and that's where your containers run. Now what's interesting in, in the Kubernetes architecture is the smallest unit that you provision and manage is not a container even though this is all built for containers, they actually created another abstraction called a pod. Because in many cases, you might have two containers that, that, that are related and they really need to run together in the same place. And so the, the pod approach allows you to, to organize your containers in a way so that if you need them to run together and um, in the same spot, they can. And so that's the key, the, the first resource type that Kubernetes introduced was a pod. 
And again, what happens in a pod, it's visually shown here on the right, is it's a basically a collection of application containers and volumes, and they run in the same execution environment. And that pod is the smallest deployable unit in a Kubernetes cluster. So, um, you know, if you just have a single container, well, you'll put a single container in a pod. Now applications in the same pod, these container applications in the same pod, they're gonna share an IP address and they're gonna share a port space. They're gonna share the same host name and they can communicate using native inter-process communication and they can share mounted volume storage. Um, application containers that run in different pods are gonna have a different IP address, different host name. And believe it or not, it's as if, if they're in different pods, it's really as if they're running on different servers. So when you're designing your pods, the question you ask yourself is, will these containers work correctly if they land on different machines? And if that's the case, you can put your containers in different pods. Another good example of where you put containers in different pods is when you have, say, a web application and a database. You typically would put those in different pods because you typically scale the web application up at a higher rate than you do your databases. And so by putting them in different pods, Kubernetes can scale up multiple copies of the application, the web application, um, and do that to a higher level than, than, than the database, which you typically don't scale, scale as large. So if we look at the features provided by Kubernetes pods, um, basically there's basic features like you can create list and delete your pods, and you can run the commands um, in your pods containers. So you can run commands in the, in the containers that run in your pods, and you can copy files to and from the containers that run in your pods. And there's ways from your local machine to actually test and connect your connectivity and test the applications that run in the pods. And then one of the key features of Kubernetes, and it's got several that distinguish it from previous cloud infrastructures. One, it's got out of scaling built in, and we're gonna talk a little more about that. But also it has built in, it keeps track of your pod applications to see if they're still up and running. So uh, really important to you, if you want 10 copies of your pod up and running, that, that all 10 stay up and running. And if a couple crash, that Kubernetes can recognize that a couple crashed and can actually start a few new ones. So there's what they call liveness probes and readiness probes that enable Kubernetes to keep track of your pods and make sure they're up and running or start new ones if it needs to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Kubernetes is a declarative approach. So you specify what you want and then Kubernetes will make it happen. And YAML specifications, YAML file specifications are typically what is used and so if you look on the right here, we have a very simple specification. We've got the API version that's being used. We have the resource type. And in this case, that's a pod. We give the pod a name. In this case, we're calling it Nginx. And then we use our specification. Again, we get to specify what we want to happen. The container that we're gonna run has a name. We're gonna give it a name Nginx as well. And the container Docker image, the container image is uh, you know using a standard the standard labeling for Im container images is nginx version you know with a tag of 179 and then we can also say what ports are used by that container image and so we take this yaml specification and we run a kubernetes command called kube control where we say kube control create and give the, the name of this file and that file gets passed into kubernetes and kubernetes will look at the file and say well, he wants a pod running. He wants the pod to have a container with a particular container image called Nginx 179, and it's using container port 80. I'm gonna make that happen for you. And that's what Kubernetes does. So that's a very basic feature, but the great, you know, the neat thing about Kubernetes is it gives you way more than basic features. And one of the key features that you're gonna like is the ability for Kubernetes to say, um, I want more than one copy of the pod up and running. And there's a new resource type called a replica set. And so the replica set is a controller or a, a pod manager that will make sure the proper number of your pods that you wanted are always running. So 
Um, the pods, the pods are managed by the replica set, and if if any of them crash, the replica set controller is going to figure out that some of them crash, and it's going to start new ones up in their place. They may end up on a different server, but if you know, in this example, we'll see on the right, we wanted three replicas. If one or two go down, the replica set's going to recognize that and say, well. He wants three. I only see one running. I better start two more up. And so um, if we look at the, speci the specification here on the right, um, we see that the resource type is different. The kind value is replica set. Um, we give it a name called front end. And now we use labels. In Kubernetes, we, we, we label everything with key value pairs. And that's how the different uh, uh, pod managers know what they're trying to keep track of. So, so in this case, uh, there's going to be some labels. Uh, there's a label for app guest book and, and tiers, the other label of the values front end. And you see in red here that we want three replicas. So we want three replicas and we've got some matching function that says, okay, well, how do you know which pods are yours? And there's a little match expression that says, well, Basically, if you read this, it says, I need the pods that have um, a, a key of tier with a value of front end in it. And then at the lower part of the specification, so at the top talks about the replica set and what it's trying to manage. And at the bottom, there is a nested specification that actually says, oh, and here are the pods that I'm trying to start up. And here are the pods that I need to worry about. So this one specification defines your replica set uh, controller, and it also just defines what it's going to manage. And in this case, it's managing some containers. The name is PHP Redis. And here's the image for that um, example there. And so it's got, it's, it's got the image example. It's got the port. And so we have all the functionality that we had with the pod resource that was on the page before this. But now we're also saying, hey, keep three copies of this running at all times. And uh, again, we use the same command at the bottom, kube control create to create the specific, the, to, to actually create the, the pods and create the container images and deploy them and keep track of them just from the specification. So why, you know, why operators love this capability is because it helps keep them from getting those calls in the middle of the night. So normally they've got pager duty, they got the page, pager goes off, the application crashed, they've got to hustle and go, you know, go, go get the thing back up and start it again. But um, in this case with Kubernetes, Kubernetes is going to recognize that applications have failed before the person gets paged and ideally will start them back up and keep the application back up and running. So a lot of value here um, from Kubernetes compared to previous cloud infrastructures. So here's a quick example. We started with three replicas, but now all we have to do is update the YAML specification. And we see that on the right and change the replica value from three to six. And guess what Kubernetes is gonna do? Kubernetes is gonna say, oh, wow, we had three, but now you want six. Well, I've only got three running, but you want six, so let me get three more up and running. So this is basically the same YAML specification. All we did was change the value of the number of replicas. And after doing that, Kubernetes will get that up and running and go from three to six. And these replica sets are easily deleted. And um, there's also auto scaling. This is a great feature. So what you can say is start with three replicas and go up to seven every time the CPU percentage, uh, uh, the CPU percentage utilization is at 80%. So again, unlike previous cloud infrastructures, Kubernetes came with auto scaling built in and this, this and its replica support were huge advantages and why, why Kubernetes has become so popular um, in so many industries. Now I told you a whole lot about replica sets but you're pretty much not going to use them because there's another resource type in Kubernetes that has all the benefits of replica sets um, called deployments, but also supports rolling out new versions of your application. So it's starting to handle some basic lifecycle management. So again, most people will use a deployment as opposed to a replica set. 
Um, and so we'll, we'll get into the details of the AML specification in a couple of charts, but the beauty of the deployments is they allow you to easily move from one version of your application to a new version, and you get, it allows you to easily control how the rollouts are done. So you can do rollouts done quickly where let's say you have a, there's three copies of your current application and you need a new one out, it'll rapidly get three of the new ones out. And then only after those three new ones, the new versions are out, will it delete the old ones? Or you could go slowly where you, you only um, roll out just a few at a time. So there's different ways to roll out fast or slow and deployments give you the ability to do that. And this all runs server side. So if you get disconnected while you're running these commands, you're not gonna cause any harm. Um, and then pictorially in the bottom here, this is what this looks like. You had your, your one set of replica sets from, from version one, um, and then there was a newer version. And then the top here is, is the latest version. So you can see three different versions and each one has three pods and those are three deployments. And so again, to scale, just like the replica set is very straightforward. Um, you just change the replica value from three to six and now you're gonna have that and you can run the kube control apply command and that'll get that um, value updated and it'll go from three to six. And if you want to do an update the container image, um, we have the ability here, you look at the values in red, we were able to control um, the, the speed of the update with a surge value. So if you've got three out there and you make the surge value three, it'll start three new whole copies up before it worries about deleting the old ones because you were able to three surge up to say, give, hey, you, you can use up three more. And then you have a max unavailable value that says, hey, how, how many can be unavailable at one time? So if you're nervous about you know, your, your site getting overloaded, you can say, hey, only one can be unavailable at one time while you're doing the upgrades. And then in red at the bottom, you can actually give the newer version of the application, which will be a newer version of the container image with, with a new label. So there's actually some wonderful commands here that control the deployment. You can check the status, you can pause the deployment, you can resume it, and you can see the deployment history. So, so um, you know, running your, your, your Kubernetes deployment and, and scaling out new versions is, is very straightforward. Now, what's neat about Kubernetes is the pod applications, if they crash, Kubernetes is automatically going to start new ones up and they may be on a different server. So we'll, how that makes life complicated for, for if you had a load balancer is, well, these, these pods could be crashing and be restarted on different machines and something needs to keep track of where they've moved and be able to, to find them if you're going to do load balancing. And so just a general load balancer doesn't really do that. And Kubernetes provides what it calls a service object that is essentially a proxy or a load balancer for all your pods. And that service will be assigned what's called a virtual IP address. It's also called a cluster IP address. And that IP address will then load balance to all your pods, no matter where they are in the cluster. And if they crash and get moved and restarted somewhere else, it's still gonna find them. Um, and that cluster IP address is something that can be provided to a DNS service. The readiness checks are built in. So the Kubernetes service object is only gonna start, uh, is only gonna send traffic to the pods that, that it can actually say are running. Um, and we've got some commands here on the right uh, that shows you first, we're gonna create a deployment with three replicas. And then below that, we show how we, you can use the kube control command to create a service that will expose that deployment and make it available on port 80 and the containers that it's connecting to are running on port 8000. So a lot of nice built-in features for load balancing that you get for free from Kubernetes. Um, again, a huge feature of Kubernetes is auto scaling. So think, um, um, you know, the, 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 the Friday after Thanksgiving where there's you know, or Cyber Monday where there's huge loads on the websites. Um, you can build in auto scaling and the application will scale itself uh, within the parameters that you give it. So um, uh, you know, there's many different ways to do the auto scaling, but uh, we, we're showing the horizontal auto scaling here. 
and I don't have time to go into the details, but um, you know, basically what's happening on the right here is we're declaring, hey, we're gonna run in the application, we're gonna run a service, and then we're gonna say, hey, out of scale between one and 10 copies of the uh, pod application, when you hit an 80% threshold of util utilization on the CPU. And um, there's a little, a little, little program here to create some fake load is the last, the last thing there. So if you wanna try that, you can have some fun and try out the auto scaling. Okay, so let's move over from the fundamentals to when things get serious. And let's talk about what you're gonna need running in production. And running Kube in production um, there's a lot of things you got to take care of. And fortunately, there are distributions like OpenShift that have a lot built into them to take, a lot, take away a lot of the pain that you're going to run into when running into production. And let's go through some of these. So one thing that, that OpenShift is going to give you is image creation and deployment tooling. So yes, if you're an expert at, you, you know, you spend a lot of time working with Docker, you're going to be an expert maybe about how you pull down an image, how you take your code, how your code gets merged into the image to create a new image, and how that image then gets pushed to a registry so that, that you can use it. And, and there are people that are experts on that. But if you think about the cloud native world, and we want to bring as many developers as we can in that world, we're getting uh, Python developers, we're getting Java developers, we're not getting people that are, say, full stack container developers necessarily, but they want the benefits of, of running cloud native applications and running in Kubernetes. So um, production environments like OpenShift provide great tools. They provide source to image, which is a way to go from a Git repository, you push your new code to the repository and they'll automatically pull the right base image, take your code, merge it, create a new image, push it to a registry and deploy it for you. That's a great feature that saves developers a lot of pain, especially the developers who are not the world's expert on creating those Docker images. And OpenShift is also gonna give you image and configuration change detection as well. So, so it's gonna worry about your images and when the configurations have changed and redeploy for you. The other thing that OpenShift is gonna give you in production is security guardrails. So when you, when you run in production, security is a big deal, very big deal. So you need to worry about not doing things that, were, that I'd call running with scissors, okay? So classic example, running privileged containers by default in, in a production environment is bad because it gives you a lot of surface area to exploit a privileged container. A privileged container runs as root and running those in production, unless you really, really wanted to do that, you don't want to be able to do that by default. So OpenShift is going to look for that and keep you from doing that. Similarly, um, setting all the security knobs and turning them all the right way in Kubernetes really requires some expertise. OpenShift will bundle those up into profiles. It calls them security context constraints. And so you can be safe. You use the right context constraint and you can be safe that you're going to get the right security that you intended. And then another thing that can happen, there's these things called namespaces. But if you run in the default namespace, again, that can be a security vulnerability and that's really frowned upon. OpenShift is gonna keep you from doing that out of the box and, and force you to pick a namespace and force you to pick some security policies. Similarly, running in production, you need to worry about your cluster size management, not just your application. You, you know, you, you, how many worker nodes do you have and can you start up new worker nodes if you need them? OpenShift is a production uh, Kubernetes distribution that gives you that capability. And it also gives you what we call automated day two operations. It gives you automated installation, automated updates, and it's gonna worry about making sure the operating system that's installed and the version of Kubernetes that's installed, that everything is, 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 is aligned and that those peacefully, those work well together. So as you go from learning about Kubernetes to getting serious about production, um, highly recommend you use something like OpenShift so you have less headaches and you worry about more of the fun stuff, which is building your application. So as you run in production, again, we're talking more about running production. Let's talk about continuous delivery. So here are some continuous delivery fundamentals to worry about. Worry about small batch changes. All your changes should be incremental and finite. 
so that you don't break the world and you can keep rolling those out. Source control everything. Uh, everything in Kubernetes is either a, a, say a Docker file for creating the image or uh, YAML deployment files. You can source control all your configuration files. And so you can even understand who's changed the configuration and keep track of it. Um, your developer environments, you can keep those very similar to what your production-like environments are. So you don't run into the, well, it worked on my laptop issue because you could really help the, the developer environment look more like the production environment. Um, and again, you can start doing your continuous integration of changes and start doing highly automated testing. Now, if you didn't get all of this detail here, don't worry. At the end, I've got links to two books and the first book covers a lot of this in great detail and it's a free book. So, um, so look out for that. But, but these continuous delivery fundamentals are very, very important and um, they help you to really take and get the most benefits out of cloud native. Um, now an advanced technique for doing continuous integration and continuous delivery for Kubernetes is a new tool, new delivery system called Tekton. And Tekton actually itself runs as a Kubernetes based cloud native application. And so um, the, the benefits of it running as a cloud native application is it it's, it's also got the redundancy of a, of a cloud native application. So since it runs as a cloud native application, it has multiple copies, it has scalability, your, your, your CICD, CICD system is not going to be your bottleneck and it's not going to fail because it, it's in itself is cloud native. And Tekton does provide a dashboard, a dashboard for managing its CICD workloads. It's got event trigger and webhook support, um, and it's got shared storage. So you can build these really complex pipelines of what your build processes are and then your deployment processes are. And usually one step feeds into the next step, feeds into the next step, and it provides a shared storage area, volume storage area to make that easy. And it's got some basic key constructs. We'll talk about them. It's got steps, tasks, and pipelines. On the right here is a very, uh, is a task and each task has multiple steps. And what happens, um, if we go to the next chart, um, so what happens in a step? A step runs a command in a container. So it's already container aware. Understand you're gonna need certain containers, certain versions of operating systems with certain build tools. And the step will then run its commands on those containers. A task, is, is a list of steps that run sequentially on the same pod. So the tasks are there and they contain lots of steps. And then a pipeline is uh, composes or puts together in a graph form multiple tasks. So you can build up really complex CI CD co delivery uh, systems using these this, this whole notion of building some steps, you put them into tasks and then the pipelines pull all the tasks and, and they can do things where one thing has to run before another, or it can do things where two different tasks can run in parallel. So a lot of flexibility in how you define your pipelines and, and how these things run. And those tasks are reusable, so you can share them across your organization. And that's what the, you know, you look at the picture here on the right, it's showing a pretty complex situation. So it looks like I got about five minutes Sorry left. to interrupt you, Brad. Five minutes? Yeah, right? yeah, five minutes. So feel free to take questions or um, oh, we'll start anyone wrapping as, up. Mm -hmm. as you I'll wish. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll start taking a question about two minutes. So a lot of cool stuff there. I won't go into it here, but everything's just simple YAML files to create your tasks and put them together in a pipeline. Um, so, so take a look at tekton.dev and go check that out. Um, you can extend Kubernetes with what are called operators. So this allows you to add new resource types and control the lifecycle management of those resource types. Again, I can't go into too much detail. Kubernetes was great for stateless applications out of the box, but how do you manage stateful applications like databases and worry about doing backups and worrying about all the state? And if you have special lifecycle management you need to create, well, the wonderful thing about Kubernetes, it is built in this new extensibility to do that with the, this capability called operators 
and you can build these and make them really, really complex. And if you go look on the right, there's Operator Hub. There's lots of operators out there for all kinds of stateful applications that will allow you to extend the Kubernetes platform in an amazing amount of ways. Um, and so we're wrapping up here. If I went too fast, here's the first book. There's a link, you can get it. It covers a lot of the basics that we covered in this presentation. So feel free to get your free online book. Um, last year I was signing these at All Things Open and hopefully next year I'll be signing books as well. Looking forward to getting back to seeing everyone in person. And here's a sneak preview of my latest book. It covers more of the, the latter part of the presentation where we talk about OpenShift in production and you know, running in production and, 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 and it's Kubernetes, but you know, the features that make it easy. O'Reilly is giving you a 30 day trial. So there's a link for the 30 day trial. And once you get your 30 day trial, there's a link here at the bottom, take a picture that will give you uh, the first couple chapters are already available. And we're going to be delivering a few more chapters really, really soon. So enjoy the sneak preview for the book. It'll be out early next year, hopefully. And I'll leave that one up because that is my last chart and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brett. So please um, type your questions into the chat window uh, if you can. Uh, if you do put them into the Q&A window accidentally, that's fine because I'll just copy them over. Brad, as I said, is working on a dual screen display and he's taking questions uh, in a different screen. Yep, so if you put them in the chat, I should be able to see them. Or you can raise your hand. Uh, you can click to raise your hand, or if there aren't any questions, feel free to use the remaining time, which is unfortunately only about two minutes for uh, general discussion or mm -hmm. comments or anything else anyone wants to add. Yeah, and I'm, I'm available on Twitter at Brad Topol, and I'm always on it. So you can always get a hold of me and I can DM you my email address if you have any questions. <laughs>